name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Brethren in Christ, laudate Jesus Christus in secula. This is Timothy Flanders with the Meaning of Catholic. I'm joined today by Nathaniel Richards. Nathaniel, how you doing, brother? Man, I'm doing all right. Thanks for having me on here. Yeah, we're really happy to have you on. Nathaniel's been a writer at Meaning of Catholic for some time now. Um, I think the past six, eight months or so. I don't actually know when you started writing. I, oh, I think it was last Advent, actually, if I recall. Yeah, I had an Advent piece. Um, but I, Nathaniel is is a very talented writer. I, I've really enjoyed his his style. It's very Chestertonian. <laughs> it's uh, I think Kennedy Kennedy has a, a Chesterton flair, but I think Nathaniel really has a strong Chestertonianisms. So <laughs> I've really enjoyed Nathaniel's writing. There's a link below if you'd like to take a look at uh, what Nathaniel's written over the almost year that he's been me with Meaning of Catholic, but he's never been on the YouTube show. Right. So we're really happy to have you, Nathaniel, and we're going to talk about your journey and get to know you a little bit more. And uh, we are promoting uh, Nathaniel's wife just had a baby. How is your wife and child, Nathaniel? You know, you wife, uh, mother and child are doing well. Um, just kind of the normal post postpartum stuff, trying to, you know, heal, get well, all that thing. Baby's hungry. It's definitely a newborn. Um, I have a, uh, I have a 20 month old uh, son before our daughter, whom we just had. So just kind of seeing, I guess now, I mean, as a relatively new father, kind of see, you know, because once you have the first child, you kind of, they always stay with you. You don't realize that they're growing. And then you have a newborn, compare that with your 20 month old. And you're like, oh yeah, it is different. You know, it's just so those dynamics of seeing having a newborn plus another younger child, uh, you know, it's just rolling with it, seeing how it goes. Absolutely. And praise the Lord. We're really happy that uh, your wife and baby are doing well. We're promoting uh, Nathaniel Richards' medical fund, uh, Richards Babies versus the medical establishment. So if you want the Richards Babies to win this fight against the medical, medical establishment, please donate. There's 17 donors so far. We've got $4,280. They need $15,000. Um, I don't know, if Nathaniel, if you want to get into any details in terms of the story or whatnot, um, but... I think the, the title kind of says it all. And yeah. many of, I'm sure many families have been through something like this before. Yeah. So um, the uh, medical establishment wants 15,000. And uh, I don't know how many of you viewers have 15,000 laying around, but I sure don't. So uh, the Richards family is relying on the charity of their Catholic brethren. So please donate anything you can donate, five bucks, 10 bucks, 12 bucks, whatever. Donate something. And that'll help the Richards family out. So please donate. Um, and I'm sure they, uh, Nathaniel, you want to say anything about that? I mean, just pretty much, you know, my wife and I were wanting to be faithful Catholics, you know, being open to life um, and welcoming life whenever it comes. Um, especially um, the stuff we're dealing with right now. Um, at, when we first had my first son back in 2019, we had, two insurances. We had my insurance. We had her father's insurance. You know, we thought between these two insurances, things will get taken care of. Um, and here we are at least a year and a half later, we're still battling claims and things, you know, being there and due and, you know, trying to get things sorted out, but then things get thrown into collections. It's, it's kind of, it's, it's very stressful and it's a mess. And, you know, uh, you know, I have faith that God will take care of us. Um, I also know that we just recently had another child and those are more claims and more things financially to sort out with the hospital and the insurance and so on. Um, and at this point, I just have to have faith in God that we will get through that, you know, I will be able to keep, you know, a roof over our heads and food in our stomachs, et cetera. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, anything helps, uh, you know, monetarily helps. Um, I'm very thankful for all the love and support we've received so far. Uh, just in some ways, just got to keep fighting. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Being a faithful Catholic is very difficult in this day and age. And just on an economic level, it's difficult yeah. to uh, 
be a single income, have your wife be a full-time mom, the ideal situation. And it's also difficult to have a lot of children with all the medical costs and all different things. So it's difficult. So uh, please help the Richards out. So today we're going to talk about Nathaniel and his journey to Rome. And the the title of this talk is Oneness Pentecostalism to Roman Catholic. That is what Nathaniel started in. And I don't really know much about oneness Pentecostalism. Um, I know people have, I'm sure many people have heard about Pentecostalism, speaking of tongues and all that jazz. But what exactly can you, can you, Nathaniel, can you start the story with uh, your childhood? You grew up and tell us about what is, what exactly is oneness Pentecostalism? Okay. Um, well, um, I'm sure you will guide me along any uh, bunny trails I get into, but yeah, I am the son of a oneness Pentecostal preacher. Um, and I grew up in that movement. Uh, you know, to try to give a general uh, idea what uh, oneness, Pentecostal, oneness Pentecostalism is in a nutshell. Um, basically, you got your normal Pentecostalism stuff, you know, you, the charismatic gifts of usually speaking in tongues, faith, healing, prophecy, what, what have you, you know. Um, but the biggest thing about oneness Pentecostalism is the Christological aspect, um, which would be um, they don't believe in the Trinity. Um, and so they deny the Trinity. Um, and so where it gets tricky, because a lot of people, again, they're, they don't they're not into theological minutia or whatnot. But, you know, oneness Pentecostals will say, um, you know, Jesus is God. And, you know, to most Trinitarians, we're like, we believe Jesus is God. But it's how they believe Jesus is God or divine that's the kicker. And when it comes down to it, um, the way one is Pentecostals believe that Jesus is God um, um, is in the vein of early Christological heresies. Um, and modalism um, is the is the the Christological heresy, um, which is why you know the early church rejected it, um, and you know why you know even Pentecostals in the early 20th century you know had a parting of ways um, because the Trinitarian Pentecostals were like, no, this is a heresy. We can't, we can't subscribe to this. Could you explain what, what is modalism exactly? Okay. So modalism is a, is, is a heresy um, from the early church. Uh, probably one of the uh, bigger proponents was Sibelius. He was a priest. Um, but basically the, the teaching of modalism is there's only one God, but God has manifested himself throughout time, you know, you know, maybe in the Old Testament era as father, and then in the new covenant with Jesus as son, the one God has manifested himself as the son. And then now in this new age, God has manifested himself as the Holy Spirit. So with modalism, God isn't three distinct co-eternal persons. God is a monarchical one, absolute one, monad one. Um, very comparable in some ways to maybe the Jewish depiction of God or definitely the Mohammedan Islamic depiction of what they would consider God to be as far as a monarchical single personality. So um, their, their idea is that God is basically just manifesting himself in different forms and there's yeah. not actually, so, so when, when God, according to their heresy, when God manifests himself as the son, he does not also exist as the father at the same time. Basically, and you know, when you get into, you know, and there's there's a whole lot of things you could just start going into like context talking about scripture verses or something. But basically, when it comes to Jesus, the way I kind of describe it, Jesus, you know, in their terminology is God is divine. But Jesus is the deity of the father, like the Old Testament. God, there is no distinction of uh, of father and, and, and son. The son is merely the flesh suit, as it were. Um. That is the man Jesus of Nazareth, and and so the Father is acting in this manner of Son, but there is not in a co-eternal relationship between Father and Son. And so when things like you know things that seem like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's praying and so on, um, who is Jesus praying to? Um, you know, often the apologetic can be, well, Jesus is in a sense praying to himself. Um, if you believe in the modalist uh, conception uh, uh, in modalist Christology. Um, and so therefore, like things like the Our Father, it, 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 you know, it's like Jesus is kind of like setting a good example. But it's just like, is, is Jesus saying that, you know, you can have access to the Father through me, not that I am the person of the Father, but, you know, 
whoever has the son has the fathers. All this biblical stuff that see, might seem common sense, but when you grow up in modalism, like the stuff, you see it through the modalist view, you just do. Um, so, and what, what did modalism, how did that impact your childhood in terms of Christian faith? Were you baptized modalist? Yeah, and so, yeah, that's kind of how the oneness stuff started, or kind of, there was a resurgence of modalism, uh, per se, because in the early 20th century with the revivalist movements and the tent revival meetings and the prayer meetings where, you know, things like glossolalia or speaking in tongues happened, um, you know, where Pentecostalism was going in general, you mean you have these meetings and so on. And like where the split occurred for the Trinitarian Pentecostals, um, the ones who didn't want to go into modalism, happened over um, baptism. Um, and of course, for oneness Pentecostals, one, one is Pentecostals, they bapti baptize um, in the name of Jesus only. And so the formula can vary. It can be in the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of the Lord Jesus, but they're usually known um, as Jesus only um, Pentecostals or, you know, and so they make their rebaptism or their novel form of baptism the main issue. And it kind of helped form the movement and give it uh, some fuel in those early days. Like, um, like, I don't know, and, and especially with like if issues of like private revelation and so on, that's how the, the Jesus name stuff started. Like I have a book here. Um, I, um, it's called All in Name. And to my knowledge, this is the only book I know that is written by a Catholic who came out of the oneness movement. But um, he uh, gives a short paragraph where um, – he basically gives that episode of the private revelation thing. So basically there was a um, camp meeting in Los Angeles and there's this guy named John G. Swep. And so he basically went out through the night in this camp meeting saying, Hey, I received this new revelation. Um, we've got a, you know, about the proper baptismal formula and so on. And, and so it's from like this private revelation from this early 1900s camp meeting where this baptismal issue helps create a resurgence of modalism. Um, and so with that, you know, people will get in the uh, hermeneutic arguments about same, something like Matthew 28, 19, the Great Commission, where, you know, would seem the most ostensible Trinitarian baptism formula. Um, for a modalist, they would say, no, uh, uh, basically the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are Jesus. So basically they would say that Jesus is the name of the father. Jesus is the name of the son and Jesus is the name of the Holy spirit. And so ergo you have to baptize in Jesus name only. And so they will usually, if you try to put Matthew 28, 19 at them, they'll redirect, redirect you to acts two thirty eight. And to my knowledge, acts two thirty eight is kind of like their credo. So whereas we would have the apostles creed or the Nicene creed in a way, like if you grew up in the one is Pentecostal movement, acts two to 38 becomes your credo about things pertaining to salvation. Um, so here's a, here's a shout out from, uh, we've already got one other <laughs> oneness Pentecostal right on. uh, convert to Catholicism. So uh, right excellent. I was just trying to look up how big this movement even is, but so, but basically the bottom line is they're not Christians, just like the Mormons and the Jehovah's witnesses. They would, they would, they would, they would lose, they would break away and not, be considered by the church to be even Christians at this point. As far as like, you know, little O orthodoxy goes, I mean, even with mainstream Protestantism, there's going to be issues because, you know, mainstream, even mainstream Protestants don't believe modalism. I mean, they, they know that much not to subscribe to modalism. And so um, as far as like issues of validity of baptism and so on, no, one is Pentecostals don't have a valid baptism. Um, but it, that is a, big, big drive of the oneness movement is, you know, a lot of their converts are people from varying Trinitarian denominations, Catholic, Lutheran, Presbyterian, whatever. I mean, even Pente uh, Trinitarian Pentecostals, they draw in the Trinitarians and then through their preaching and polemic, they do their best to get you rebaptized um, in their novel formula. Um, and, and for them, baptism is salvific and your baptism can really only be salvific if it's in the name of Jesus. So you were the son of a preacher of such a thing. So yeah. um, tell us about your childhood. You grew up, and at what point did you start to question this? Um, you know, I grew up, again, the son of a oneness Pentecostal preacher. My dad uh, was, prior to his conversion to, uh, you know, you know uh, a self-destructive lifestyle, I mean, 
he came basically came out of the self-destructive lifestyle into the oneness movement um, from a very, you know, I think he came in at like 17. And then from his early 20s, he was, pre, you know, ended up learning to preach. And then he went to Bible college at, uh, in the St. Louis area in Florissant, Missouri. at something that used to be a Jesuit seminary, the building, um, St. Stanislaus Seminary. But, um, but he went to Bible college there. And then from there, I mean, he, you know, was a, as a preacher, I, as far as his ministry and stuff, he, I would almost describe his ministry as nomadic. Um, he never really held down like a pastoral posi- position very long, maybe one, two, three years, but it was never, he never really put down roots. And so when my memories growing up, um, he was more of a, a traveling evangelist. He would go from church to church, ask to preach. And so he was always just, it was a different church a lot of the time when we would travel and he was preaching. And I mean, we had like a home Pentecostal church, you know, wherever he would work and so on. But he, he definitely had a sort of wanderlust that he would want to preach elsewhere. Um, you know, not just in the church we were at, um, you know, trying to buy to maybe be a, uh, an associate pastor or something. But we were always traveling and he was preaching. And, you know, I wanted to be a preacher when I was a little kid, you know, that because that's what you knew. And like, I, you know, uh, one, you know, that revivalist style, you know, where you're, you're shouting into the microphone, you're, you know, pounding the pulpit, um, you know, and it's d- depending on the theatrics, you know, my dad was a very, th- you know, is, but is a very theatrical guy. And so like with the, the, the oneness, you know, just the Pentecostal stuff, I mean, you're, you're, you're jumping up on pews, preaching your sermon, and stuff. And it's, you know, to maybe people who are in a calmer liturgical setting, they think it sounds crazy and stuff. But when you grow up with it, that's all you know, is the theatrics of Pentecostal preaching and, uh, you know, the the intensity of it, because it's intense. Right. So it, so when did you begin to question it at this point? Um, as far as like questioning, I... For me, I didn't really start questioning things too much. Um, my parents split in the mid 2000s. Uh, I think they, they they separated in 2006 and then in 2007 uh, with the divorce was like final. And so I always just, to me, Christianity was one as Pentecostalism. And so I just rejected it. You know, I did the normal, you know, a- angsty, atheist, agnostic, I don't know what I am stuff. During most of my teens, I, you know, experimented with stuff, you know, drugs, alcohol, whatever it was, the party culture. Um, and for a while, my credo was like I, I lost myself in music and so on and playing the guitar or whatever. And so John Lennon's Imagine was literally my credo. <laughs> um, that is that was what I was. And so by and large, I just kind of rejected what I thought was Christianity because it was to me one is Pentecostalism was Christianity, everything it was. Um, And so coming out of it, I would say towards my late teens, junior year of high school, getting ready to come in, um, that that year I was like finishing up, junior year of high school, getting ready to come into senior year, I had what was called maybe a theophany, um, but basically because I was in a self-medicating lifestyle, um, I basically consumed a substance where I just didn't know what happened, you know, Um, and I thought I was in hell. I, I just, I didn't know, but I came out of this trip, this thing. And I was just like, I was convinced that the supernatural was there because I thought I was dead in this trip or whatever the heck it was. And let's just say I, I didn't, I didn't want to <laughs> go back. Um, and so I, you know, I let, at the time I let my dad know about it. Of course to him, you know, praise God, glory, hallelujah, you know, prodigal son is returning all this stuff. And I'm just like, I don't know, but God's real. The, there's something out there because, you know, but as I went along and, you, you know, try to, you know, get sober and try to figure all everything out. I don't know. It's just like the oneness Pentecostal ambiance just wasn't me. And it wasn't because I necessarily just wanted to harden my heart as it were, or, or something like that. I just, it wasn't me because for me, like a, a large reason why I re- rejected one is Pentecostalism when I thought it was the all in all of what Christianity was, was probably because it, you know, it tended not to be very uh, 
intellectually driven. Um, um, things were generally condemned, um, so on and so forth. And I, I, I was a reader. And so I just, I read books. And so while I would have scruples now about things like Harry Potter at the time, things like that were just, you know, novels like that were just off the table, you know, everything's of the devil, so on and so forth. But so I just read a lot of books. I was, you know, I was a nerdy guy. And so I, I try to say I was open-minded, etc. cetera. Um, but the intellectual aspect wasn't there when it's Pentecostalism. And in, especially in my branch, you know, it was definitely a KJV only type of thing. And maybe some different translations were used, but, you know. And that, that's just for viewers. That's a movement in Protestantism where they believe that you can only use the King James Bible. Yeah. From uh, King James the first of England in the 1600s. 1611. Yeah. And, you know, and there's just a, a lot of things, but, Basically, I just started reading when, once I was after this post trip, post things like God is real somehow, I, you know. And so, you know, I was just doing, you know, the, the gateway drug of apologetics, C.S. Lewis, um, uh, you know, just mere Christianity, problem with pain, anything that was C.S. Lewis, I was trying to get my hands on. And, you know, I honestly, uh, I was just trying to read and from somehow another Catholicism kind of got in my head a little bit. I think my brother found an antique rosary at an antiques, uh, antique store and he thought it was a necklace. And I, I kind of looked at it and I thought it was weird. Um, and so it was just kind of there, the rosary is in my head, but I'm just kind of, I looked it up a few times or whatever, and I'm whatever. And it was just kind of a thing of reading different things. And I, you know, once I started kind of like looking at like early church and Catholicism, I just started going to the library and looking at different things. And like, like the only reason I read Chesterton, you know, probably a mighty one of the greatest Catholic apologists of the last century. Um, that's because on a, uh, I had no idea really that he was a Roman Catholic. I, uh, at first I was, I was, had a good idea maybe, but I was just saw orthodoxy on a shelf. I picked it up and I, you know, the, the cover had this big fat bearded man with glasses. I'm like, okay. And I read it all in pretty much at one sitting. And it was just by, I guess, those lay apologists, you know, even though C.S. Lewis isn't Catholic, but those lay apologists for all intents and purposes. I mean, I read, yeah, Lewis, Chesterton, Dorothy Sayers, you know, um, she was Anglican too. But it was just just the basic creedal Christianity type stuff. I was getting that because I never had that, you know, learning things about things like a creed, you know. And so I started reading books about, you know, the Nicene Creed. I mean, it just... It's just like once you start reading, you get you you don't stop. And so you just keep finding different things. But it was because I was reading. I got to a point where even I was pretty much my senior year of high school by that point where I was like, you know, I was, you know, Googling things. It's like I was watching EWT in masses, you know, um, and I was just like, I think I want to try to go to a mass. Um, and it was because um, I got to that conviction where I just wanted to see what it was about, I mean, I hadn't been really to much liturgical or Trinitarian anything, you know, um, growing up in the oneness movement. Um, and so it was just like, I got to a point that fall of, you know, I think it was, uh, 2012 where I was just like, I just want to want to see. And I kind of, I knew I probably should have, uh, kept quiet about it, but I ended up trying to talk to my dad about it at the time. Um, and uh, so your dad uh, is, is at this point, are your dad and your mom both involved in your religious journey? I would say at this time, um, you know, late high school, I had, you know, my parents are separated and divorced, but I, uh, I basically was living with my dad. And so uh, at this time he was just coming out of pastoring one of the, his projects and so he had stopped pastoring that church because um, we were we were living in central Missouri and we were literally driving an hour, hour and a half to go to Louisiana, Missouri, which is right on the Mississippi River. And so it was kind of a drive and it wasn't working out. And and so maybe for him, he wasn't in a pastorate at that point And I was coming at him with Catholicism. But it was kind of a, it was kind of a hard um, senior year of high school because I was you know, I was continuing to delve into things and everything he did was kind of 
reactionary in some ways. Cause I was reading, you know, Pope Benedict the 16th was still Pope at the time, but I was reading Pope Benedict the 16th, you know, Jesus for Nazareth stuff, which again, to someone who had no idea, I mean, it was great. And, you know, I was just trying to get into Christianity as, you know, what I perceive to be the continuation from the early church to now. Um, but, you know, he knew I was reading that stuff and he would go to the Bible college library nearby and he would get books on Catholicism and stuff pinned by Jack Chick. You know, if you know who Jack Chick is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just, just for viewers, Jack Chick is, is a uh, cartoonist, I think is the best way to call him. He's basically a Protestant apologist who calls the Roman Catholic Church the whore of Babylon and all this. Actually, everything that all the Protestants used to say 200 years ago, all of them did. Pope is the Antichrist. They all said that back in the day. So he's kind of continuing on Luther and Calvin. But at this point, he just looks ridiculous. Well, yeah. it's, it's, it's so ignorant. He doesn't understand a thing he's talking about, you know? Well, and it's because, like, we would have these little dialogues. My dad was obviously concerned, but some of his stuff was fueled by Jack Chick. And Jack Chick, a lot of his stuff came from um, this book from, like, I think, like, somewhere in the 1800s. But it's called, like, The, uh, the Two Babylons. It's like... The author's name is Hislop, and it's a lot of anti-Catholic propaganda, um, but he was sourced there. And there were, like, claims. Like, I remember one claim. That's where I went to, like, research it, which, like, you know, like, you go to a, you look at a cross or generic stuff on, like, a tombstone or, you know, IHS for Jesus. Yeah. And so, like, basically, like, the claim from the Jack Chick pamphlet um, was... Uh, well, yeah, it's Isis, Horus, and Seth, right? Yeah, and that's what my... <laughs> That's what my dad told me. And I looked into it and obviously, you know, it's just like, no, this is the name of Jesus. It's a <laughs> monogram and other things like that. And so we would go back and forth with this type of stuff. And, right. you know, obviously, you know, the Jack Chick stuff isn't, isn't solid or anything, but this is the stuff you're dealing with. This is like, you know, this stuff I don't even, you know, cause it's like up until then, my father has been my spiritual authority, my spiritual guide in some ways. And, you know, you, you know, you respect all that, but it was just like, no, this isn't true. Um, and so you were able to sift through some of this kind of pop. Did you ever encounter really, really solid Protestant apologetics against Catholicism? I would say that happened after I became Catholic. OK, OK, um, so we'll, we'll get to that then. So yeah, yeah. so where um, so when do you actually go to become Catholic? Do you? Because you were Anglican too, what happens next in terms of religious affiliation? Okay, so basically, I graduate high school, and at this point, I decided I wanted to go ahead and probably get a basically move away from my dad, and you know, we needed some space, etc. And so I, I, I go back down to the Ozarks from Central Missouri. Now I'm back in the Ozarks, and so on. And so. I, I'm there. I just graduated high, high school. I trying to figure some things out and I just try to go to like, you know, regular Novus Ordo masses now that I have like the opportunity and the freedom without like, you know, some sort of retaliation or I don't know, just to keep the peace. And so I'm going to Novus Ordo masses and, you know, I'm trying to make it work. And then I finally get it the guts that summer of 2013 to maybe go to an inquiry session at the parish I was going to Novus Ordo masses at. Um, and I'm like, okay, well, maybe I can, you know, try to become Catholic. And um, I, I, I basically went into it, what was an inquiry session, um, and everybody was nice to me. Um, there was an older Monsignor who even helped me find the RCIA, RCIA room and so on. But what I encountered was just, I don't know, it was just, it didn't, match up with like all the hype I had gotten in my mind from reading, you know, all the apologetics and the theology and the history. It's like, I have that all here, but then I come to this inquiry session and I guess what like set me or get, got me really disappointed was like, they're like, I was like the, like one of the only people in this inquiry session. And so I'm here and I'm like, okay, I, I get it. It's inquiry. It's not, uh, it's not main RCIA, not more people are here. So it's just me. But I'm here at uh, this inquiry session and they're like, Nathaniel, tell us like, why, why the Catholic church? Why, why do you want to come in? And I'm going on this long rant about, man, I love monasticism and how they save Western civilization and so on. 
and I'm doing all this stuff. And 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 one one of the helpers or the RCIA guides or whatever is like looks at me and it's like, uh, what's monasticism? And I'm just like, you know, that 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 popped my balloon. I'm deflated. I'm just like, like, what do you mean? What's monasticism? Catholicism is what you know, the monks, nuns, all this stuff comes from, you know, it's like, and so, you know, I, with that, I was, you know, polite towards the end, listening to the stuff, you know, still having conversation, but like in my heart, in my mind, I was like, you don't know what monks are, you know, and that just totally like got to the point where, you know, I just kind of kept doing my own thing, kept reading, you know, maybe church hopping every now and then, but it was just like, I didn't want to become Catholic. You know, that was, you know, it's like, you know, I would finally got to a point where I was really dialoguing with, I, with the mainstream Catholic institution. And I was just like, if that's all you got, you don't know what monks are. Why should I, you know, and, you know, and that's in, you know, an 18 year old kid's mind at the time. But it was just like, it was very disappointing. Um, and so from there, I was still dialoguing with my high school history teacher. He was a low church Anglican priest. Um, and during my senior year of high school, he helped me talk about Trinitarian stuff, basic stuff, you know, and try to come to a Trinitarian mindset. And, you know, I wasn't able to get to a Catholic mass while under my father's household, but through dialoguing and stuff, at my, to my father's credit, he did let me attend um, this low church Anglican mission um, and just to see basic liturgical things, um, you know, uh, and so I got to do that a handful of times. And so I still maintain this relationship with my history teacher who happened to be an Anglican priest. He's now an Anglican bishop within that denomination. But um, but basically because I maintained this dialogue and I just was not at the point really thrilled or convinced by what I encountered or perceived to be by Rome. Uh, that November, uh, I think it was November 17th in 2013, I was baptized in the Low Church Anglican parish. Um, I, I drove back up to my hometown area, got baptized, and then I came back to the Ozarks and church hopped for a while. <laughs> um, so I was Anglican because I was christened in the Anglican church, but it wasn't like I was confessionally Anglican. Like, you know, I still wasn't necessarily like, wow, Book of Common Prayer, you know, the 39 articles, uh, I have to be confessionally reformed. You know, I was just like, if I can't be Catholic, I'll be Anglican or something that looks quasi Catholic. You know what I mean? So that, that was kind of where I was as an 18 year old. Um, and, you know, and I church shop, I went to the Episcopal church a few times, but obviously I knew that the Episcopal church, as far as doctrine, they may have pretty liturgies from time to time, but they're so far left and crazy that it's like, that's not a viable option for me. Um, and so I just, you know, I just continued to read scripture, um, tried to, work on my project of finishing the Bible and, you know, you know, cause even as a preacher's son, I hadn't actually read the Bible like all the way for myself. And even though, you know, generally, you know, you know, only scripture, everything is God breathed so on, but it's like, I didn't know the scriptures per se, even though I was a preacher's son, you know? And so I was trying to work on that. And so I was just kind of in this limbo period for a while. I, I just was kind of church hopping, reading, searching the scriptures. And I had, I was working at a grocery store and I came in contact with a Catholic seminarian and another girl whose brother was a seminarian, but she was Catholic and she would bring a like Catholic apologetics books and read them on her lunch break. And so it was through Catholics that I worked with that I started having that dialogue again. Um, I even prayed a, a rosary in the parking lot, the grocery store parking lot with this seminarian guy. Um, so, I mean, the dialogue was still open. I just was kind of in limbo. But because uh, because I had these friends, um, uh, I, I, I met, you know, the one girl with the seminarian brother. I ended up meeting her brother, who was a seminarian. So I made some seminarian friends in tw about 2014. And I was, you know, definitely getting convinced that I should try to give Catholicism another go. But, you know, I was just at that point where it's like, well, I'm already I'm baptized, you know, Anglican. And, and so you're just like, again, it's not like I'm hugely confessionally Anglican or anything. I'm just, I'm just trying to make it work um, because I, I really wanted to be Catholic, but it just didn't seem to be an, a viable option. And so summer of 2014 is when I sign up for another round of RCIA. And then I, from September, 2014 to, you know, Easter vigil, 2015, that's, 
my real RCIA experience. Okay, excellent. Yeah, ju and just a reminder to viewers to always evangelize your neighbors because there's souls all around you who are seeking the truth, that are weary, that are forlorn. I'm eternally grateful to the Catholics in the same way that Nathaniel is. We're both converts here. So open your mouth and speak the truth and charity. So what, so Nathaniel, you finally go through, you muscle your way through RCIA. You become Catholic. You receive confirmation 2015. Mm -hmm. And what makes you, what, what, what happens next? You said that the, the best arguments were after you became Catholic that right. you faced. Go ahead. You know, you know, going through my 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 real round of RCIA, just gritting my teeth and getting through it. You know, for the most part, it was it was okay. It was like we watched Bishop Barian videos. You know, the Catholicism series. We were just doing. I was just tr trying to be as gung ho as I could. I knew there would probably be squishy moments, and there were like um, there were times like you know some of the teachers would be like, well, maybe there won't be women priests, but there could be deaconesses and stuff like that. But then like the one thing in my full RCA round that shook me like shook me where I thought I might not, again, I got to the point where it's like, I probably can't be Catholic was the, 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 the RCA teacher literally denied that there was an eternal hell. And from somebody who, you know, Pentecostal preaching, it does nothing but get hellfire, you know, the fear of hell into you. Um, and it's just, you know, it's in the, it's in JP two's catechism. It's a, it's, it's Catholic. There's an eternal hell if you reject God. Um, and, I guess we came onto that point because I was trying to tell talk and, you know, have this dialogue. It's like, you know, it's like Protestant misconception that purgatory is like this third eternal option that you're not good enough or you're not uh, bad enough. And so you just stay in a sort of limbo. And that's what they think purgatory is. But it's like, after the last judgment, there is no purgatory. It's heaven or hell. And then she's like riffed on that. And then she's like, Oh, and that also means that there's no eternal hell either, or there's no hell either. And I'm like, what? And then like, 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 I don't know if my hands are shaking, but I know my heart was like through the roof. I was just looking and she's like talking about, you know, universalist arguments and St. Catherine of Siena, this and blah, 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 blah. But I'm like the catechism scripture, you know, I was trying to do some very different things and it didn't matter. And, and so I, 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 I it shook me. And so I, that was like three or four weeks before Easter vigil. And I was that close because oh, of man. <laughs> Because so what, I mean, what made you go through with it three weeks in or three weeks away? I, I I talked to some people. I even talked to my mom about it. You know, just I mean, it was just kind of just I was talking to everyone I could. And of course, the non-Catholics were like, well, gee, that's uh, you know, that kind of is like, well, gee, yeah, that's not right. And but, you know, the, the some of the Catholics I talked to obviously were like, OK, did you talk to the priest about it? And I did talk to the priest of that one parish about it. And he just kind of talked about purgatory and. And hell, and he seemed shocked to hear that I was saying that. I don't know personally that anything ever got done. I know there was some pamphlets outside of the chapel that were kind of empty-ish. And then, you know, a few days after I said something, there was like a, a pamphlet that said, hell, it hasn't gone away, you know. And it was like some pamphlet that was uh, the Divine Mercy. Um, it was plugging the Divine Mercy. But I was just like, hmm, I wonder if that pamphlet was there because I said something about, <laughs> I don't know. You just kind of think that way. Um but I went through it because I think I got to the point where it's like, I just was like, I went, I went, had my first confession. I just, I just did it. It's like, you know, I'm going to do it. I'm going to, you know, cause that's, that's generally the consensus you get from Catholics who are sympathetic that you're going through something, a bad RCA experience. They're just like, grit your teeth, come in. You'll be happier once you're here. And so that's generally, I don't know if there was, there was a Volta or a turning point that got me past that really bad experience. I just kind of was like, I'm just going to do it. And so I did. And I came into the church and praise God that I did. You know, I was given the graces to at least do that. Um, but as far as, I guess, coming from, yeah, I'm confirmed and the sacraments of initiation, I kind of struggled. I, I, I was good for about a year, like going to mass, getting in there. Um, but I was I was good for about a year. But then I just had a, a point where I really struggled um, with status quo Catholicism, mainstream Catholicism. I just, I couldn't do it. I, I just got to a point where I really, I don't know, kind of broke down in a way. <laughs> um, uh, and I think it happened mostly because 
I had, I, I, I talked to people and I dialogue and I saw that there were, I guess there are smart Protestants out there that, that aren't just your mega churchers who aren't just your, uh, uh, you know, your Bible thumping Baptists and maybe the more liturgical you know, Presbyterian reform, put a trademark symbol there, you know, they're smart, they're confessional, they're so on. And I had dialogues as a new Catholic, like the year I had, and they, they, they hounded me really hard. Like I went to this uh, dinner party thing. It was like a, a event for this Presbyterian guy. His, his YouTube channel is like, his name's Joffrey and he's Joffrey the giant and stuff. He's really tall, but he's a confessional Presbyterian. You know, he's definitely reformed and- Old school I, Protestants. Yeah. And so it's like, I hadn't really- come up with that, you know, this is like these type of people, they believe in the Nicene Creed. They might even in their liturgy do the Nicene Creed. And so on. they're, they're not Catholic or, or anything, but I came in with those type of arguments and, you know, I, I was struggling because I was just kind of like, you know, this is like, should I really have become Catholic? You know, I don't want to just ride a triumphalist wave or something, you know, you, your mind thinks like that, but you know, I was, you know, and this is 2016 where I kind of broke down and Amoris Laetitia come out and all you know, this Pope Francis stuff. And, you know, I wanted to, I don't know, I, just a lot of stuff was going around in my head and heart and stuff, but it was just like, I, I got to a point where it's like, I can't Pope explain anymore. Mm -hmm. I, I, I can't make Pope Francis make any sense. Um, no, I can't, I, at this point, are you in the ordinariate or does that come later? That's kind of a little bit later. Okay. Okay. Sorry to get ahead of it. Yeah. yeah so no, you're, no, you're, no, no. You can't, you're, you're tired of Pope splinting. Okay. So what do yeah. you do next then? So what I do is I, I just kind of continue dialoguing. I had been in contact with some people from that one like Presbyterian, like book me party or whatever. And I, I just kind of kept talking. I met up with one of the people. He was like, dude, I will read the Summa Theologiae if you read all of Calvin's Institutes. And so we kind of had the dialogue session, met up a few times, and I really hit the the institutes. Now I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't read them all the way, but I got a good chunk into the institutes. And so I was really, for probably for the first time, honestly, trying to counter magisterial Protestantism. And so I was finally more so than I did with you know, my low church Anglicanism, which you know my my Anglican bishop, uh, you know, who baptized me and everything. You know, he's definitely of that mind of you know, very low church Calvinist Anglican type thing. But it's just at my mind in mind at that point, I thought, oh, this is look, you know, Anglicanism, Catholic light, you know, via media, middle way, I can do this. I didn't even think about theology really. I was just like, I just want to be baptized Trinitarian. I want to, I just want to be a Christian, you know. Um, but it was after I became a Catholic that I started dealing with like magisterial Protestant arguments and really trying to digest Am I doing the right thing by being here and dealing with, you know, our, our, our current situation as Roman Catholics? Yeah, those, um, those are, yeah, the magisterial Protestants are the really good Protestants who can argue and stand toe to toe with Catholics. They can actually make good arguments. Well, yeah, it's, than, you know, these evangelical jack tricks, they, they don't even know the church fathers yeah. or anything like that, you know. And I have to say, it's just like, because again, as, as, as a high, late high schooler, I was listening to EWTN on the radios, listen to all the Catholic answer stuff. And that stuff is good to a point when you're trying to refute Jack Chick, when you're trying to refute Baptists or refute basic fundamentalist Protestants. But when you try to like, you can't do that stuff with magisterial Protestants. With right. smart so, Protestants. so how did you, how did you get and un untangle yourself from the magisterial Protestants? Um, I basically, you know, that summer of 2016, I was I was trying to read a lot of stuff. I, I, I just remember reading Calvin and N.T. Wright for whatever reason that summer. I read a lot of it, um, but I just basically got to a point where, again, it was a more personal. Um, it was a more personal uh, encounter, like uh, like because I had stopped going to mass and I was unfortunately slipping into some bad stuff as far as sin and so on. And it was about the fall of that year where I had a seminary, again, a seminarian friend who was like, Hey, we're, we're here. Going to go grab a few, you know, beers or whatever. Do you want to come? I'm like, okay. And I, again, it was just like a, it's like, okay, I'll come. 
And it was because, you know, I, I was able to come to have beers that fall or whatever, even though I'd been basically left the church. It was just like, I just don't want to go to mass. I can't do this. I can't make it work. Um, you know, and I still struggle, but it was because of that one encounter of going and having a beer that there was a priest that just happened to be there from my, from my memory who happened to be there. Um, and so it's just like, you know, you know, and that, that pretty much was it. And I was like, okay, well, he better go hear my confession in my car. <laughs> and then, you know, you try to make it work and you're still struggling, but it was encounters like that that helped me just come back, even though I knew there were still problems. I knew that, you know, Rome isn't built in a day or these problems aren't conquered in a day, but it was just like, that's the point where it's just like, it was because I went out with the seminarians, was able to find a priest who was there. I came back to the church, you know, even though I still struggled and so on. Um, and I came into the ordinariate. I, I probably visited the ordinariate for the first time that way too. Cause I had another friend who was a priest who had once been a seminarian, but just because he's in the seminary and becoming a priest pool of friends, you know, he knew my story. And so he basically was like, you know, maybe you should check out this ordinariate mission, um, you know, and see, tell me what you think. Just, you know, he's regular associate pastor doing all the sacerdotal uh, grunt work because he's an, a new priest, you know, Nova Sordo guy, but he's just like, go tell me what this ordinariate thing is about. And so, I, I mean, I did. And so about that fall of 2016, I started visiting uh, this ordinary mission in the Ozarks area. And, you know, it, it just, it was nice because it reminded me of the, my little blip of Anglicanism and, you know, the vows and thighs. And there's some stuff from Cramner's prayer book there in the ordinary liturgy. Um, and so it just, it felt a little bit more right, I guess, you know, just from my experience, excuse me. Um, and, you know, I, I, I uh, you know, I just, I liked, you know, at Orientum liturgy, um, this particular peri parish, you do, it is communion on the tongue um, because he, uh, uh, the, the, the pastor there serves by intinction. So it is on the tongue uh, as far as receiving the Eucharist. And, you know, it, it was just stuff that you didn't really get to do in a Novus Ordo parish. Um, and it just helped me, I guess, stay Catholic. Um, and so I was definitely happy uh, in the ordinary for some time. I, I honestly, I only visited that year and I didn't actually become a member of that ordinary parish until uh, early 2017. Um, is when I became full fledged or ordinary. So you're in the ordinary and 2017 fully Anglican ordinary yeah. now. And then at some point you marry your wife. Yeah. Where did she come in? Well, at that time I was, you know, trying to do school. I had been in community college, got my associate's degree. And then I was like, okay, what do I do now that I have an associate's degree? So I go to Missouri State University and I try to be an English major because um, I just don't know. I'm like, okay, let's let's do it. Um, and so I meet my wife. Uh, she was in a creative writing and American literature class. Um, they were like, those classes were back to back. And so she would like follow me from American literature down to creative writing. And so I met my wife as an English major. Um, but, you know, she was Baptist-ish is how she described it. Um, cause she didn't necessarily, wasn't necessarily like confessionally reformed Baptist or Southern Baptist or any sort of Baptist. It was just like Baptist district. I go to a Baptist church and, you know, her parents were, um, uh, assemblies of God, though the father was a cradle Catholic and it later became, you know, assemblies of God. Um, um, and so, you know, it's just definitely generic, not Catholic, you know, that's what she was. And, you know, and so you know, we kind of talked about faith and stuff and she realized that I was, you know, definitely faith was like one of my number one things. You know, I was, I read all the time about it and I talked about Jesus a lot. And from a Protestant perspective, that's generally all you need to know um, about someone. And, you know, we went through it and so on. Um, I will say for her, uh, once she came to a, the first mass I took her to was just a generic Novus Ordo. And she kind of cried because she, at the end of the mass, she's like, I just don't get what's different. I don't understand why, you know, cause she knows like, you know, if you were to have a future, like marriage, children, all that, you know, the church, the Catholic church is going to insist that those children be Catholics, insist that they be baptized 
and raised in the faith. And at the time she's like, I just don't know what's different. And, and so the next Sunday I took her to the ordinary at mass because it was more opportune to go. And, and then like, you know, just with the community there at the time and just the way things were, she understood more, I guess, what Catholicism was. I don't know if it was the aesthetic of, you know, ad orientum liturgy. I know it was with this particular parish, there was a, a fellowship meal after, and there, you know, some families at the time who had large, uh, larger families had kids running around. And I just, just saw kind of what Catholic families can be and what parish life can be in a sense. Um, and, you know, I was very surprised with her because, you know, it was the spring semester of 2017, you know, we started talking or dating. We, we started like our first date was sometime in March, but she like made a decision to become Catholic really early on after our like, you know, dialoguing and talking like, like she came Catholic, like she decided like in early April, she's like, no, I want to become Catholic. And thanks to at least this parish, she didn't have to do the school year RCIA program stuff. She was able to meet one-on-one -on -one with the priest. And so she decided in April, she came into the church in August. So praise the Lord. Yeah. yeah. And it's, and it's interesting that you're, um, women often have a very different conversion experience than men. Men are so they're always obsessed with reading so much, but I've seen it so many different times with so many different couples where the, the woman, sort of has an experience of some kind, whether it's an emotional or aesthetic or it's different things like that, that just sort of, she senses the truth of it. And, and I, th I think that's that's beautiful. One of the beautiful feminine things that women are gifted with. Um, so you're in the ordinariate and br now you're, but now you're at a diocesan Latin mass. So bring us through the story. How did this all come about? Well, I mean, I have to be honest with you. I. I was just happy being in the ordinary for a long time. I mean, I just, it seemed the perfect compromise in some ways you could have again, at Orientum liturgy, you know, at this parish communion on the tongue, there was no responsorial Psalms in the way there are Novus Ordos. Um, granted with the ordinary, you have the new lectionary and you do can't have responsorial Psalms, all that kind of stuff. But it was just like, I found a place where I felt at home and especially with the community aspect with you know meals after mass and so on and so forth. And I was happy. Um, I would say we, you know, we got married in the ordinary at liturgy, uh, in 2018 and, you know, it, it was beautiful and all that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, going on so forth, my, 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 my first born, my son Gilbert was baptized in the ordinary at liturgy. Um, you know, uh, and so I, it was great. Um, basically what really got my, me concerned about the ordinary at was not so much the, you know, the aesthetics of it, not so much the, I don't know. It's, uh, it was more with 2019. Um, what concerned me was uh, the father of Von Trico situation is it, it. And again, this isn't what made me leave the ordinary in total, but it concerned me and it helped, I guess, maybe, act as a catalyst for me to start asking other questions about this particular parish I was at. But I mean, to, in my mind, you know, and this is, you know, maybe there's a better way to say this, but it's like, I thought the ordinary, here's a way to be trad without having to go to the Latin mass. I mean, that, that's, that's what it was. It's like, cause you know, it's like everybody reads the same trad stuff. Everybody watches the same podcasts. Everybody has the same conversations about, you know, vegano summer shame, uh, you know, reverence for the litur liturgy, what can we do? All that, that bubble, that trad Catholic bubble is like, I was in it, but I wasn't Latin mass, you know? And I got to the point where, especially with this father Von Trico situation, I saw it and, you know, like everyone else, I listened to this homily that went, you know, was posted by the remnant and then kind of went viral, I guess a little bit, um, and got his name out there. Um, but I only found out about his situation in a kind of a backwards way. Like I was reading an article on one Peter five and there was just, I don't even know what the article was, 
but I was looking at it, the bottom paragraph and there was something hyperlinked. You know, it's basically kind of like this phrase is like, you know, you know, meanwhile, priests like Father James Martin get to do this, that, you know, the stuff that Father James Martin does um, with the LGBTQ XYZ stuff. But but then it was like, and then priests like this get excommunicated. And that was like the hyperlink. And I clicked the hyperlink. And then I was like, Father Von Trico, ordinariate, excommunicated. And I'm like, what? I had never heard of it. And I was just kind of like, why is like because in in my mind and whatever bubble I was in, I was like, ordinary it's trad. Why are we having this? You know, is is traditionally Catholic. Why are we having this? Why are we excommunicating this man? What's going on? And so I tried contacting my pastor about this. Uh, he sent me a quick email, you know, saying, "Don't believe what you read in the news media. Um, you know, they don't have all the facts, all that." Um, and I'm like, okay, I'm. Fine. I, I, you know, I'm willing to, I'm willing to do that. You know, just, just for viewers that Von Treco is basically a priest in the ordinary who was excommunicated. At least part of the reason was that he preached a sermon, which essentially articulated a, the basic trad position that uh, basically the Pope and Paul the six are sort of throwing their lot with the UN. They're just, they're not preaching the gospel, that type of thing. Yeah. He was excommunicated. Go ahead. Um, but yeah, so yeah, that's who Father Von Trico is. And that's why the situation concerned me because it's like, I know how generally how my pastor believes and feels. And it's like, it's not too different from Father Von Trico. And it's like, I know what I'm kind of believing in. And, and so it's like, in your mind, you're kind of like, am I excommunicated? You know, and that's the kind of stuff that you're kind of like, it's like, and so, you know, we have these after parish meals after masses most Sundays. And so the next Sunday, he didn't really talk to me about it. I just let it go. Um, and then the next Sunday after that, he kind of talked. He's like, you asked about the Father Von Trico stuff. And I'm like, yeah. And it's like, and, it, and we kind of having a discussion about it. But basically what I got was uh, Von Trico wasn't excommunicated for the homily. That was kind of like one of the main phrases. It's like, it's not the homily. It's not the homily. It's not the homily. And I'm like, okay, well, what really is it? And it's like, you know, basically the, the, the thing was, I can't say um, what it is and that there's a gag order in Rome. I probably already said too much, that kind of thing. I'm like, okay. And so I let it go. Cause you know, trying to work, trying to take care of wife and kid, all that stuff. And then there was another Sunday or mass where the pastor read um, this kind of pre-printed statement but it was, again, kind of the same talking points he had with me in private. But it was just like, don't believe what you read um, from the sites online, the blogosphere, that kind of stuff. Don't believe what you read online. They don't have all the facts. Um, uh, you know, you know, pray for Father Von Trico. Pray for Bishop, bishop Stephen Lopes, who is the bishop of the ordinariate in the USA and Canada. Um, pray for the bishop. Pray for Father Trico. All that. Um and I was just kind of like, I don't know, just the way it was like at the time I was like, is he kind of directing it to me? It's like, who else is asking him about this? Because our parish was small and, and, and admittedly, maybe I shouldn't have been thinking that way. But I was just kind of like, OK. And and later on in that meal, like I, I basically have uh, the pastor come up to me and he, he is kind of on one on one. He's like, did all that make sense? And I'm like, I guess. I mean, you know, and again, we kind of got into kind of an intense discussion about some other things too. But I, my, my, my main concerns in this discussion were, you know, you know, I know how you believe what happens if you're excommunicated. Um, you know, the pastor, what happens if you're excommunicated? Um, you know, why haven't like, from what I've read, like, why hasn't like the bishop told the parishioners who like appealed to him why their priest was excommunicated. Um, and then I had some concerns because at that time and point in history, like the Amazon Synod was coming up in the fall. And I was just kind of like, there was all these appeals to Rome. Like, you know, Rome will settle this question. Once this gag order on Trico is settled, Rome will settle this question. Um, and I, I was probably a little bit too tongue in cheek, but I'm like, you know, it's like, this is the same Rome who wants to make Yucca Eucharists or, or there's propositions, you know, for the Synod the Amazon Synod, you know, um, you know, this, this is, this, and I, I didn't know anything about Pachamama, anything about that stuff, because it hadn't happened yet. This was like July. Um, and I was just concerned. Um, 
but there were just some other things, but that conversation just, it just really bothered me because I was basically told you're not excommunicated. Trico's not excommunicated for the homily. It's something else, but you're not excommunicated. Don't worry. And I'm just kind of like, I don't feel right. I don't feel good. I don't, I don't like where I'm at right now. You know, there's, there's something off and I don't know what it is. And I'm just a little guy. I'm just a member of the laity. I don't, I can't, you know, I can't pl play detective, um, you know, and there are other personal kind of parish issue, issues um, that I kind of had to deal with. Um, and I try to look into, and I probably shouldn't have looked into, um, but I brought people to this parish. That was the thing. That's why I was concerned because I felt in a way that my name was on the line because I had brought people to this parish whom I worked with, you know, people, I, I, I try to evangelize and, I just like, if I'm selling this parish to other people, you know, I want it to be okay, generally, um, but just the whole ordinary culture, especially post Von Trico, it really concerned me. And it, and it came to the point, at least for me, it was like beyond the personal parish stuff and, you know, anything I might have as a beef between me and the pastor, which I hope is done. We, we've tried to talk about it and, and so on. It's like, that stuff is done, I hope, and I believe. But it was just like, my concerns with like the ordinary are more of a doctrinal nature. It's just like, it's not enough to have the aesthetic of ad orientum liturgy or communion on the tongue. It's like, where are we doctrinally? What do we believe about these issues that were in Father Trico's homily or anything else? Um, and so I just was like, I don't feel comfortable, but I generally was like, I'm probably going to have to go to the diocesan Latin mass. And I did. And, you know, the diocesan Latin mass is beautiful. Um, it's definitely a thing where everybody drives in and then kind of goes home because there's only, to my knowledge, one diocesan Latin mass in my diocese. Um, but, you know, you just work with what you've got. And it wasn't, again, it wasn't like I was just like, man, the Latin mass is the best thing since sliced bread. And I, it was an adjustment. And I had been to a few times before, but it got to the point where like, if I'm going to be a Catholic and believe what I believe about the sacraments, about doctrine, about history, be consistent and not have this huge cognitive dissonance. It's like, if I'm going to be in the Roman right, it's like the Latin mass really is the only option at this point. Right. Okay. So let me ask one more question that we have a few questions from the audience. Sure. Um, so at this point we've got Pachamama, Pope Francis, et cetera, et cetera. What makes you stay Catholic at this point? You know, I think what makes me a Catholic is simply the sacraments are real and the sac sacraments um, are efficacious and they work. Um, it's like when I receive the Eucharist, you know, in general, it's like not to be feeling space, but it's in general, I feel better when I receive the Eucharist. When I go to confession and I confess my sins, a weight is lifted from me. My soul feels better. Um, and it's like the sacraments work. The sacraments are real. Jesus Christ, you receive Jesus Christ in the sacrament of the Eucharist and you receive his pardon in the confessional. And it's like, you can't get that anywhere else um, as far as, you know, sacraments because Jesus Christ instituted a church. He instituted the sacraments. This is my body. This is my blood. It comes down to, the, you know, the Eucharist. And I don't want that to be a cliche Catholic answer, but it's just like, I have gotten to a point where I've driven myself crazy by reading all the usual suspects via trad blogs or trad podcasts. It is, in a sense, if that's all you do is look at church news or the latest hot take, you will go insane. I know, because it affects your spirituality. It, it affects your soul. Um, and I, I think, especially because we're in a 24-hour news cycle, and we do have a Pope that opines on airplanes and so on and so forth, or has a 90 year old atheist that says, Pope Francis said this. If that's all you do is look at the Pope, what the, the, an 90 year old atheist says about what the Pope said, and we don't really know because there's ambiguity from the Vatican who won't clarify anything, it seems. You know, if that's all you do is, is worry if Pope Francis said there is no hell or people are, are annihilated who are, dan you know, damned or if there's only annihilationalism or, 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 or anything that, like that and you worry about that it will take a toll on your soul like and I say this as a Roman Catholic someone who believes 
what the church has historically taught about the papacy, you know, as someone who believes in the ecumenical councils and believes that the Roman Catholic church is the visible church of Jesus Christ. It's just like, like, it's not that you're not supposed to ask questions and you are, but I feel like I'm just trying to, I guess, making a sort of empirical argument just from my own experience. It's like, if you, all you do is are in the trad news cycle, you will go insane. I, I don't know how to yeah. put that, no, that, that That's, that's, it's, it's crucially important because people want to, people are, are stuck in the vice of curiosity, which is obsessing about less important knowledge to the neglect of what's more important. And I think what you just said sums it all up is the Eucharist. That's it. I, I think that that's not a cliche answer. That's, that's, that is the answer. Jesus Christ is the answer. Now we can talk about the Greek schismatics and we've already dealt with that on this show many times. So if you're interested viewers, you can search that. Uh, I have a playlist covering that as well as to why you should not be a Greek schismatic, but here's some questions from the audience. Okay. Uh, Mr. Richards, do you have a specific devotion at heart or one that you particularly recommend? Um, I guess I have maybe two. Um, I would say um, you need to have some sort of rosary beads. Um, definitely praying the rosary. And I mentioned earlier, you know, my brother had that antique rosary and that kind of got my, the gears, you know, moving in my head. And I eventually taught myself by looking at things online and so on about praying the rosary, but the rosary always stay with me. And not because I think, because sometimes praying the rosary can be quite dry. I mean, and you'd really have to work on the meditation part. And if you're not careful, you could, you know, I mean, get stuck and, you know, you know, and, and just be chanting Hail Marys and not knowing why you're doing that. But the rosary really is one of the greatest Catholic devotions for a reason. And again, I don't want that to be a cliche thing because you always hear the rosary, the rosary, the rosary, but it is there for a it reason. Really is. <laughs> it, it is. There. Um, and it, I think it's because again, the rosary, uh, it engages, you know, the senses, you know, your mind, your heart, your, your rustling some beads in your hands. Um, and that's great. Um, I would say beyond the rosary, Eucharistic adoration. When I was in my RCIA program, as sketchy as it could be sometimes, and as much as I struggled with being in at times a pretty liberal, progressive, just the, our post-conciliar situation in the church right now, dealing with that stuff in RCIA, my, my rock, my, the thing I went to the most there was Eucharistic adoration at the cathedral parish where I was going to RCA. And there were some Vietnamese sisters who would be there and, you know, sing the Salve Regina at benediction. And some, most times the priest, I mean, the priest would offer benediction, but sometimes they'd break out incense, sometimes not. But just having, like, I think it was Monday or Tuesday night, but pretty much when I was going to weekly RCA classes, I was going to, I was going to at least, I was going to benediction and at least, you know, half an hour of adoration before. I mean, but that's what really got me into staying with adoration. Um, and then our diocese before COVID and stuff had a perpetual adoration chapel. And so I was, you know, trying to make a holy hour go as often as I could. And before COVID, my confirmation sponsor and I would make a holy hour every Sunday night in front of the Blessed Sacrament. That, that's a really great devotion, especially if we're, if we're kind of saying that we need, just need to focus on the Eucharist. That's excellent. Um, here's a great question from Joseph Taylor. Do you think that the ordinary was a bad idea by Benedict the 16th? I've had people tell me it's just an English TLM, but the Anglican church is such a wreck. I don't see how that doesn't bleed into it. So for viewers, if you haven't, you've never heard of the ordinary, it is the largest mass conversion of Protestants since the reformation. So it's certainly a significant moment, but Benedict the 16th basically created its own diocese for the, for the whole world or for different regions. Yeah. And they they have a Anglican they have an English mass which is mostly the Latin mass in English but it also has different readings. So, but tell us your thoughts on that question. Was the ordinary a bad idea? Is it bringing in bad Anglicans or bad Anglicanism? I would say. I mean, I might get in a few bunny trails, but it's just going to have to happen. Um, I would say with the ordinary, it, I won't s say bad per se. I mean, again, I was a fan of Benedict the Sixteenth before a bunch of this stuff happened. I, I read his books as a non-Catholic, really being curious about the Catholic Church, and so I still have a place in my heart for Benedict the Sixteenth, even though I know, you know, with Novel Theology and all that stuff, he's not as much of a traditional Catholic as you might want him to be. But I still respect the Holy Father, um, you, know, you know, Pope Emeritus. Um, 
And I think the ordinariate is something that could only happen because of Vatican II. Um, had Vatican II not happened, um, you know, I, I, I just don't know. But because of the ecumenical stuff with that, you know, post-conciliar stuff, you know, the, the, not just with the ecumen ec ecumenism, but interfaith dialogue, there's just this openness since Vatican II. Um, and, you know, and just the fact that, you know, uh, I, I, I just don't know. If Vatican II hadn't happened, I don't know if a pope would be thinking about in incorporating English clergymen into it because Benedict XVI was, you know, he had Anglican norm Chaitibus, you know, um, and creating the ordinary and everything. But, you know, the, the J John Paul II allowed the pastoral provision um, to happen where English clergymen could potentially have a shot at becoming Catholic priests. Uh, and so it's been going on for a while in the post-conciliar post era. Um, I just, I don't know. I mean, and I'm not a historical scholar or anything. It's just my take on it. It's just, I just don't know. If, if Vatican II hadn't happened, I just don't know if it would have ha happened. Uh, as far as like the ordinary at liturgy, I will say in some ways, it feels like the ordinary is kind of in the, it's kind of in a, in, in, in a limbo of sorts because at one hand they want maybe more traditional minded, minded people to come. Um, but at the same time, it's very much a via media middle road thing where you're not really going to be critiquing Vatican II, um, or some of the stuff is, we don't like Eucharistic abuses or, you know, the, the liturgical abuses that happen often in the Novus Ordo. Um, people don't usually like them in, in the ordinary and so on. What I would say about the ordinary and Anglicanism in general, you have to keep in mind, probably what Benedict XVI was hoping for and is general is this high church Anglicans, you know, Anglicans who are more in the vein of the Oxford movement and John Henry Newman. Um, high church Anglicans, yeah, they probably might consider the ordinary if uh, they want to continue to have like the sacral English that they might have had and, you know, ad orientum and stuff if they don't want to go to, uh, you know, a Novus Ordo or something like that. But the thing is with the ordinary and Anglicanism in general, Anglicanism is a spectrum. Not everybody is a, like this conservative high church smells and bells thing. Like I was baptized in a low church Anglican parish where the 39 articles at the back of the book of common prayer, which are, you know, very, you know, standard reformed talking points, anti-Catholic rejecting Catholic books of the Bible, like in the Deuterocanon or, you know, uh, praying to saints, asking for their intercession, just standard Catholic things. The 39 articles are against those things. I mean, that's just standard Anglicanism. That's, you know, the reformed part of the Anglican church. Um, but I was part in the low church Anglican, you know, that's where I was baptized. And then you have like broad church, which is kind of, you know, the best of both worlds, but, you know, trying to work, work on this middle way thing. But it's just like, it's a spectrum of what Anglicanism is. And so when you come to, people entering the ordinary, you get that spectrum trying to be streamlined. And so you'll have maybe a high church Anglican or a low church Anglican come in and have different, different views or different, differently formed spiritualities. Some might have come from a more low church Calvinistic type thing, but they read the church fathers and they convinced more of the real presence and transubstantiation and they're there. And then some people think they've already kind of believe in transubstantiation and they've already done the smells and bells and now they're just going to kind of change hats and be under the Pope's authority. I mean, and so there's like that spectrum there. And when it comes to ordaining priests, it's like that matters because not all these priests are going to be like formed the same way. Um, and so it's just like the ordinariate has scandals. I mean, the church has scandals, but especially U S ordinariate, like there was a father Luke Reese who beat his wife at the altar. And I don't know, I, I would have to look up and see his, uh, his, uh, his uh, formation and what strain of Anglicanism or, you know, whether it was like mainstream Episcopalianism or some low church continuing Anglican offshoot. Because again, Protestantism is Hydra. It splits off. There's thousands of different uh, iterations of whatever you want. But you've got to take that into account when we're trying to streamline something and bring it to the Catholic church. And I think as an insider or someone who tried to live in the ordinary, 
That's just it. It's like, is your pastor as a priest who was once an Anglican? Was he high church? Was he low church? What kind of piety was there besides the stuff that he kind of adopted with Catholicism? This stuff matters. And then it's like, furthermore, it's just like, shouldn't these people have a long, longer formation period? Like regular diocesan seminarians spend years. And it, and it seemed to me that some of these people who were coming from Anglicanism to Catholicism, it was just kind of like a, oh, you were a priest once. You had a you know, Anglican pastors, you wear a Roman collar. It's like, you've kind of done it. It's kind of the same thing. It's just, and so it seems like, you know, maybe they were a deacon for six months or whatever, but it seems almost streamlined. And it's like, no, you need more Catholic formation. You do. Yeah. You just don't know if the ordinary has that because they're desperate for priests. And the whole church is desperate for priests. But, you know, any of your ordinary pastors, I mean, they have their ordinary parishes, but they're probably supplementing the local diocese and whatever their parish is hosted in, basically helping provide the sacraments for whatever uh, geographic diocese they're in. And so it's just kind of like, I don't know. It's just, we're in a priest shortage. And personally, my concern for the ordinary is where, where's the formation for these priests? We can't just write them off and say, Hey, you're an Anglican priest. You can automatically become a Catholic priest. And I don't think all the candidates have been accepted, but it's just like, even if you are accepted, Anglicanism is not the same thing as the Catholic Church. Right. Faith. We need a bigger vetting process. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Process. yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. And we, we certainly uh, wish shout out to every Anglican ordinariate member out there. Don't we don't want to, you know, um, pass judgment on the whole thing or anything. Yeah. Just, certainly Nathaniel's not trying to say that, you know, just no, and I mean, oh. I still have friends who are at this Anglican ordinary parish. I wish all the best for it. And in some ways, yes, I do think it's kind of a liturgical experiment. I, you know, again, I was for a time, I was very happy being in the ordinary. It's just, I'm personally at a place where I can't, that I can't have an apologetic for the ordinary anymore. That's just, that's yeah, it. Absolutely. Well, we certainly celebrate the, the whole conversion of all these souls. And in fact, it was also a group of Lutherans that were much smaller than the Anglicans, but it was actually an Anglican Lutheran ordinariate uh, originally. So we certainly celebrate the the mass conversion. Um, but yeah, you're, you're making great points here. So, uh, but we got to wrap up. So I just wanted to, once again, please uh, go over to the link that is below and support the Richards Babies versus Medical Establishment Medical Fund. Give anything you can, uh, five, 10, 12, 50, hundred dollars that helps the Richards family. And, uh, Nathaniel appreciates your support. So Nathaniel, thanks for all your great work. Thanks for your writings at meaning of Catholic. And we hope to talk again soon. Right. So Thank let's offer up, I'm going to offer up an, our father for, uh, baby, baby Richards. What's her name? The, uh, my daughter's name is Arwen Therese. So Arwen, Arwen Therese. Therese. <laughs> Beautiful name. So we'll offer up our, our father for mom and baby uh, and for the whole Richards family. And thanks, Nathaniel, for coming on. No problem. Thank you for having me. In the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.